Good evening. Welcome to the panel discussion portion of this year's Social Hour for Social Issues event on the subject of civil discourse, a conversation about discovering shared opportunity, removing barriers, lessening polarization, and promoting understanding. We are thrilled to have so many members and guests with us this evening as we discuss this timely topic at such a time in our nation's history. Thank you for sharing your time with us. I want to give a special welcome to our accomplished panelists and this evening's featured community partner, Morin Van Allen. Significant gratitude is due to the Signature Events Subcommittee for Education Committee, which has worked very hard to put this evening together. This group was a part of the Social Hour as identified through the title of Social Hour for Social Issues team within their name. Now I am excited to welcome our Member Education Committee Chair and Board Member, Vita Harvey, who will bring greetings from the Board of Directors. Welcome everyone. As Patricia mentioned, my name is Vita Harvey and I am the current Chair of the Member Education Committee for Women's Action and sit on the Board. The Signature Events Work Team for the, the Member Education Committee this year is led by Beth Hansen and Esther Zoe Thane. And they have worked hard and tirelessly to bring this program together, um, even in this virtual space. If you've been to our previous events, Social Hour for Social Issues or Women in Wisdom, you'll notice that the format of this event is very different uh, with the movie preceding the discussion. Um, so we hope you enjoyed it, um, but welcome any feedback that you might have after the program. Rest assured that if you are just joining us and you haven't seen the movie, you will still be able to fully enjoy tonight's panel and discussion. Speaking of panels, we've assembled a fantastic panel for tonight's event. They'll be discussing a very important and timely topic. Building on this year's Women's Impact Fund theme of curiosity and our goal as a committee to bring you educational, relevant, and timely events, we hope to give you some ideas on how to have uncomfortable discussions and position yourself to learn from people with whom you may not agree. Before we begin, though, we'd like to thank our featured community sponsor, Morin Van Allen PLLC, for their support. Brianna McRae from Morin Van Allen is joining us tonight. We'd like to welcome her. Brianna is an attorney in the Financial Services Group at Morin Van Allen, where she represents financial institutions in connection with the structuring and documentation of syndicated credit facilities. She received her undergraduate degree from Hamilton College and her law degree from Duke University School of Law. Um, although she's a true recovering New Yorker, Brianna happily resides in South Charlotte with her husband and two daughters. So I'll turn it over to you now, Brianna. Thank you. Um, Morin Van Allen, and can everyone hear me? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Morin Van Allen is thrilled to be um, sponsoring this event, this timely event this evening. Um, as we all watched our country have a renewed activism, um, Morin Van Allen focused on really within and, and making sure that its employees had the opportunity to have those difficult conversations. And it did this by engaging in firm wide discussions. We all read how to be an anti-racist. We had a separate discussion about um, how to identify our bias. Um, and really to bring in, in what we do every day as attorneys or as staff members. Um, and it really was an opportunity for us to engage with each other, to have these conversations. Because at the end of the day, when I wake up, I'm black. And when I go to Morin Van Allen and I walk into Bank of America Corporate Center, I'm still black. And we all bring these experiences to work with us and, and they can affect what we do uh, and how we conduct ourselves. And I have the honor of introducing our moderator, Octavia Sewell, this evening. Um, Octavia is a consultant um, focused on organizational and community um, engagement with a focus on equality, uh, equity, and inclusion. Um, she has years of experiencing develop, experience developing and facilitating discussions such as these um, and where we can engage in open dialogue. Um, so we're thrilled to have her uh, moderating today with our wonderful panelists and, and I'll pass it off so that she can begin our, our, our discussion. Thank you. Octavia, you need to unmute. We can't hear you. There I am. Sorry. Thank you, Kama. I'm thanking. Uh, I'm thanking Brianna. I'm thanking Vita. I'm thanking Patricia and all of you that put this amazing uh, 
project together tonight, the Social Hour for Social Issues Committee. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with this amazing panel and to be with all of you to talk about something that I think is really important. It's actually near and dear to my heart. Um, I think that we, uh, to say that we're in a, a polarized environment is a cliche now. We see it, we smell it, we hear it, we experience it. So that's a given. And it was interesting to see the film. I think we commented in the social hour that, gee, it seemed actually kind of calm back then. Uh, I think we've escalated some of the, some of the polarization. So we, we see that in, obviously in the election coming up. I think everybody's ready for when is it going to be over? And, uh, but we also know that the polarization probably will not go away when that's over. We see it about the pandemic, vaccine, school, masks. We see it about um, social and racial injustice, including Black Lives Matter, um, immigration. All the things that were raised in the film, I think, are still very much with us. These are all topics that matter to us. Most of these topics really matter to us, and we have starkly different views about them when we think about society. So I'm really impressed that the committee would say, let's confront something that's right in front of us now. I think they're really asking us to ask a question, which is, can we, how can we connect with each other, interact with each other uh, in a way that allows us to talk about these differences, about these topics about which we may have different views and to leave those interactions feeling like we have listened, we've connected, and we hopefully have understood better. And I think the other thing we don't want to leave these interactions with is feeling totally burned out, because I know some of us feel that way, and certainly that we've not burned bridges. So that's what we're going to explore tonight. And I'll have to also say that I'm interested in how this can help us to build social capital. How can we really connect more as a society rather than retreating to our individual camps? So we've got a stellar, stellar panel to help us with that. I'm going to give um, their names and titles and organizations only. Uh, please look at their bios. They are in the chat. They're also on the Women's Impact uh, website because these are wonderful individuals that have rich experience to share with you. I'm also going to ask them when they answer the first question to give you a little bit more information about what connects them personally or professionally to this topic. So alphabetically, we have Tanya Blackman, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Diversity, Inclusion and Equity Officer at Novant Health. Keneal Kultman is Senior Vice President, Chief Community and External Affairs Officer for Atrium Health. Becca Curl is the managing partner at Living Room Conversations, which means she's all about dialogue. And Gil McGregor is a nationally known motivational speaker, keynote and motivational speaker. He also is a broadcaster, was on the original broadcast team for the Charlotte Hornets. Gil is visually impaired, so he's asked uh, me to let you know that he will be on the phone only. Last but not least is Kama Pierce, and she is the Chief Operating Officer at the Levine Museum of the New South in Charlotte. I'm going to be asking the panelists some questions that the committee actually developed. And a little bit later, we'll go to hearing some questions from the attendees. So in these first questions, I'm going to ask all the panelists to respond. I've also told them they can engage with each other. Uh, they don't have to wait for a a question from me. If you have a question, please put it in the chat. Uh, someone is going to be collecting those questions and sending them to me via text. You can direct a question to one or two specific panelists or just in general. So that's the way it's going to work. Let's get started. So I want to ask each panelist to share a little bit more about what in your experience, professional or personal, connects you to this topic? And also something that I think that we're all asking is how are you, 
how are you maintaining friendships with people who may have very different views or values than you do? How are you engaging with them? I think that's going to be helpful for everyone. And I'm just going to call on Becca, if you'd like to get us started, Becca. You're on mute, Becca. Oh no. <laughs> there she is. Octavia, you want me to jump in while Becca works? Yes, okay. yes, yes, I'm a well, I, I work for the Levine Museum, so we do a lot of these. So <laughs> I, this happens in this new world of technology. Um, I think what I will start with is to level set for all of us to have the same definition of what civil discourse is. Um, so that we know that we're talking about the same thing. Um, I think of civil discourse, I think we do it for understanding. And I think a lot of times we mistake civil discourse with debate, right? Which is when you have an opposing position and you wanna win. And I think that's getting muddled a little bit in today's uh, time. And I've spent my entire professional career around these terms and these concepts because before I joined the Levine Museum, whose mission is to bring differences together and have dialogue around history, our, our mission is actually to use history to build a better community. Um, I was a lawyer and I started my legal career um, very fortunately as a law clerk at the Third Circuit um, Court of Appeals. Um, and my judge was a young, at the time, now he's chief judge, he was a young Clinton appointee. And on the court in the Third Circuit before he was on the Supreme Court was Judge Alito, who was appointed by Bush. And these men on the bench in Third Circuit and women really modeled for me the importance of having dialogue for understanding. Because after a hearing, I was privy to listening to their debates and they were always respectful. They were coming at the law on issue from different places. Sometimes my judge would walk out and, and he said, you know, Judge Alito or Judge Becker who, Becker, who were more conservative, made this inter interesting point came, I think we need to look into it. And I'd say to him, oh, cool, we're gonna join the majority opinion. He goes, oh, no, no, we're still dissenting. <laughs> he said, but, you know, I, they, they brought up a Really good point. And I think that has stayed with me, you know, the 30 years that I've been as a law professor and now with the Levine is that um, we can listen to each other for understanding. And sometimes that understanding can turn to persuasion, it can turn to a change, but we shouldn't enter a conversation with that expectation. So um, thank you, Kama. Is there any key tip from that you use with your own friends? Yeah, so it's always harder with friends, right? Because then it gets personal. We have, the, we have the professional and the personal. And I will tell you, it's interesting that you brought up social media. I am definitely more forceful and angry on Facebook, which my kids tell me nobody's on Facebook, but people like me 50 and over. But, you know, I, you've had that comfort. But I have a lot of friends with a lot of different opinions, especially around this election time. And I really do try to hold back and listen to their perspective and then share mine. And by civil discourse, Octavia, it doesn't mean that you're, you don't sometimes raise your voice. It doesn't mean that you don't sometimes get a little angry or um, th that's not civility. That's not Southern, like I'm gonna be, you know, civil discourse is for me, the purpose is to understand. And if you can get to that understanding and then it's been successful. So I strive, I strive on that. Thank you. Thanks very much. I just want to do a quick check and see if my audio is working now. Yes, we got it. Yay. Yep. Thank Perfect. you. Um, I'll just go ahead then while it's working. <laughs> um, so as was mentioned, I work for Living Room Conversations, which is centered around creating space for dialogue and communities. So it's what I do a lot of, but how I got into the field was actually through um, my college roommate's husband had this event in Salt Lake City. So I'm, I'm calling from Utah, um, although I did live in North Carolina for a while. I lived in Greensboro for several years. Um, and he had convened a group of therapists and some of them had practiced affirmative therapy with their LGBT clients while others had practiced reparative therapy. 
And these two groups of therapists were at the point of pursuing litigation against each other. They both were firmly convinced that within their professional code of ethics, there's no way they could be treating clients the way that they were. And so they had convened over a series of weeks and this event that I attended was kind of the culmination where they talked about that experience of just stepping back and listening to each other and trying to understand each other. And um, while they still didn't necessarily agree with each other, they realized the value that these different approaches to therapy had. And they got to the point where they could refer colleagues to each other. And I was just blown away by the power of this sort of conversation and thinking, you know, this should be happening everywhere all the time. Like we should be able to disagree with each other and still see each other as humans and respect each other and give each other grace and the benefit of the doubt. And so I started like this personal crusade where I like went to my mayor's office and was like, I think we should be having these conversations. And then um, just organized on my own for a long time and then got tapped by Living Room Conversations to become part of their team. So my personal and professional life it's something that i would have done by myself probably forever <laughs> and then um, was lucky enough to get involved with this organization that's been doing it for 10 years so as far as quick tips for how i manage this personally um i think the major sticking point for me is there's this tendency to sort of weaponize facts and get stuck in the details and so i try to always work in my personal experiences whenever I'm talking to someone with whom I disagree. Um, for example, my mother-in-law just this past weekend who has differing political views than I do sent this really sensationalized YouTube video um, that was very doom and gloom um, and vilifying of the other party. And I kind of just went through, instead of focusing on the details said, you know what, I feel like this is what I've experienced in my life. Like this is the good that I see in the welfare system and why I think it needs to be there. These are the areas where I'm a little conflicted and kind of just opened it back up. Um, and I think that that's really what dialogue is about, is about opening doors instead of like closing yourself off in your like ideological box or standing firm in your trenches and feeling like you have to defend yourself. So. Whenever you can use personal experience, I think that's a huge thing. I also try to diversify my social media feed and follow people that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, and then if I see posts that are particularly jarring, I try to reach out and just say, that was really interesting what you posted. I had never heard that before. Can you give me some more background or explanation or how have you seen this show up in your life to be able to like open those doors again? Um, and then a really easy beginner tip is to kind of start where the stakes aren't as high. So being able to convene with intention with people that, you know, maybe aren't your intimate friends or really close family members where um, things have a tendency to get more, we have less boundaries and things have a tendency to get more heated that you can kind of practice um, with just people interested in having a conversation and where the bar is really low. So. And asking a lot of questions is always good. So those are those are my tips and kind of how I got into all of this. Thank you, Becca. I love curiosity and opening doors. It's great. So Gil, let's go over to you. All right. Well, my name is Gil McGregor, and uh, I'm a, a retired broadcaster, about 25 years professionally broadcasting. But before that, I worked at Wake Forest University, my alma mater, and I was the academic advisor of athletics. I bring that up because I had three different groups that I had to try to get to merge and work together. The student athlete, the coaches, and the athletic administration, and the professors. And everybody brought a different need to the table. And I had to figure out a way to get them to work together. And it was interesting because the coaches wanted to be in charge of the athletes and run their own show. The athletes wanted to be students and athletes and think about going pro, some of them. And the professors wanted respect in the classroom and people to show up and act like they wanted to learn. And sometimes there was conflict with those three groups. And I tried to figure out a way to get them all to respect and to work together. So the main thing I tried to do professionally was to try to get everybody to respect each other's space. There are certain things that make us human. There are certain things that we all need as human beings. And if I could put that in the forefront, I would get people 
to, to work together and see the concept of team, because we were, were in an athletic environment, the concept of team would always work. The motivational speaking that I do, I, I kind of call myself a greatness coach. Um, I heard someone mention Carolina. I, again, I went to Wake Forest, and I know they mentioned Duke. So I hate Carolina on – I hate uh, Duke on game day. I hate Carolina every day. But anyway, I went to Wake Forest, and so what I tried to figure out how to do was to get people to find something that they all could agree on. And I finally got the student athletes to go to class because they wanted to get a degree. I got the professors to recognize that someone would come into class because they wanted a degree. And I got the coaches to realize that the players had to be eligible so they could play and get a degree. And when I got everybody to agree to the same thing and work for the same outcome, even though they came from different directions, that seemed to work. On a personal level, interacting with friends or acquaintances of mine who have different political ideas Sometimes I kind of shy away from that and I try to ask the question because I believe if we can all get to an aha moment and the aha moment is to get us to look at something in a way that we didn't look at it before. I was in a small town of Windsor, North Carolina, and I was talking to the leaders of the community and the people in the school districts, but I had to talk about economics and how poor people no matter what color, were looked upon, in my estimation, the same way by rich people who were white. To get poor people to understand that they may not be of the same color, but they have some of the same issues, and that if they would find their things that, that they were, had in common, they could probably live a better life because the people who were elite and rich felt the same way about them. And I use an aha moment to talk about uh, segregation in the state of North Carolina and the Jim Crow laws that I kind of grew up in. And I talked about when people uh, sold things, they got a commission. And I said, if you, if you want to make double commission, then you have to sell two things. And the issue was water fountains. To make more money, you have to sell more than one water fountain. And what happened in the Jim Crow South is the way to sell more than one water fountain is that one water fountain had to be for blacks and the other water fountain had to be for whites. But the person who was selling the water fountain, he didn't care or she didn't care about black or white, just wanted double commission. To get somebody to get an aha moment as to how maybe we've been divided by rhetoric, by policy, by culture, but somehow those things are just tricks to keep us separated so somebody else can make some money. So what I do now is I'll have a friend that maybe not as intimate, not as close as was stated earlier, and I'll ask a white friend, a white male friend, to explain to me the fear that stops people from getting together, but to explain it to me from his perspective, because I do believe that our fear divides us. And I believe whatever we fear, is what we believe doesn't have to be true but if we care enough about it to be afraid of it then we believe it so i'm hoping we can dispel some fears find some common ground and get an aha moment so we can move on to a different level of understanding thank you gil thank you for bringing up fear and thank you for bringing up the most tribal of all things in this country sports <laughs> um, we can separate it, so appreciate that. So, Keneal. Um, well, thanks, Octavia. So again, um, Keneal Coleman, I, I work for Atrium Health and Community and External Affairs, but I've actually grown up in the healthcare diversity space. That's, that's actually all I had ever done up until um, almost a year ago when I landed in this role. Um, and I got into that work when I was, I, I grew up in a really, um, I can't even call it a town, it's a very rural farming community in Western North Carolina and um, really wasn't exposed to any diversity of any kind, any way you want to call it, name diversity, racial, socioeconomic, religious, whatever, I wasn't exposed to any of it as a child. And then I remember in high school, sort of the, the elementary schools kind of fed into a high school in the neighboring town. And 
I remember there was a handful of African-American kids in my high school that just got subjected to a lot of racism. Some of it was overt, some of it was covert. Um, but I always remember being ill at ease about that. And then my first semester in undergrad, uh, a professor that I admired a lot was orchestrating this semester long dialogue alongside the local health system. And so we would get together week after week after week and there would be these structured dialogues <clears throat> whereby you'd be exposed to a movie or a diet, you know, a provocative discussion. And then you get together in these intentionally racially diverse groups and talk about deeply personal experiences around racism. And, you know, I was 18 years old and, and needed to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. And, um, I just remember those dialogues to this day being soul searing, profound, um, and, and life altering. And that was really when I made the decision that, oh my gosh, this, like, I want to devote my life to working on these structural issues around racism. And I'd like to think that's what I've done, but, but it started with a dialogue when I was, um, open-hearted and really available emotionally to taking in the experiences of the person across the table from me. Um, you know, and I, I reflected on um, being invited to be on this panel because I was like, I'm the worst person to, I'm not the role model for this, but, but I'd like to think it's therapeutic to have the invitation because maybe I'm at a point in my life where I need to get back to some of that openness. Um, and then I got really interested in conflict. Uh, my master's was in cross-cultural studies. And so I was sort of studying, you know, how cultures sort of need to work, how cultures can understand each other and, you know, bridging across cultures. And, um, and I realized how we can all miss each other sometimes. Some of it's deeply rooted in our socialization and our culture and how we've been programmed. Uh, and then I got so interested in it that I got certified a couple of times as a mediator. And so this is your tips question. Not that I'm the best person to offer tips, but I'll try anyway. But in mediation, you know, I've sat and, and facilitated a bunch of different kinds of mediations with um, legal mediations. And I don't do it anymore, but lots of employment mediations when people are disputing at work. And, and I remember that there's a certain, uh, trick that you it's not a trick but it's a tool that you use in dialogue when pe two people are disputing and and so one person may say you just never listen to me and then there's this uh dialogue technique called diamonds in the rough or that's what they called it in my mediation training which is is the mediator you say you know it sounds like it's really important for you to be heard and then you say to the other person are you interested in listening. And it's amazing how these little dialogue techniques um, can take people that are just at war with one another and shift them to a place of open heartedness. So, um, you know, in my best days when I'm good at this, which is not, maybe not as often as I'd like it to be, those are the kinds of things that I do where I shift to an open hearted space just in dialogue with friends and family. And, um, you know, we all need that um, probably now more than ever. Thank you. I love hearing in your early description that that is a hunger for people to connect in this way. Uh, and I, I, believe, I agree with that, that people really get something from connecting authentically. Tanya. Oh, thank you, Octavia. Um, you know, I, as I'm listening to everything, I was kind of tracing back to my roots a little bit. Um, I grew up military. My father's a retired Marine and um, who lives with me. And it wasn't until middle school that I really understood as much about the racial divide, because when you're military, everybody comes from the same, um, no one comes from the base. Everybody's kind of transplanted in, and then you figure out how you're gonna live with each other, how you're gonna be together, given that you're all military. So um, when I went to middle school, I really learned about what exclusion felt like, because I felt very excluded at different times, and I um, remember having a friend who uh, befriended me, and I'll never forget that that day I was sitting in the class in the um, classroom by my, um, by my by myself. It was homeroom, and there was I'm left-handed, so there was a, there was no left-handed desk, and I'm sitting there, 
and people, um, you know, no one's really talking to me. And so my, it's a, it's a long story, but to the short of it. Um, so a friend of mine who ended up being a lifelong friend of mine, we still are in touch today, came over and said to me, my name is Avis. What's your name? Oh my goodness. I still get chills about that and how it touched my heart that someone wanted to be my friend in that school that was so racially divided. Um, so that really has stayed with me. And, I, and then I went on in my life to become a social worker. And one of the things that, and I think about dialogue or getting connected to these topics, Octavia, um, of civil discourse, um, is the social worker, one of the things you taught is that there's a difference between an, a conversation and a social work interview. And in a social work interview, unpleasant subjects are not avoided. So I've kind of taken that into my work of dialogue that, you know, you, you just have to lean into it. And I say you just have to, it's not always that simple because there's a part of me that wants to kind of lean back and say, you know what, I don't want to have any more of the dialogue, I'm done. But what I'm learning in my work is that you really have to lean into it. And don't shut down because the trust and the beauty comes in continuing the dialogue. You may even have to stop that day and finish the conversation another day. I'm not working toward any particular outcome, but really to connect and really to seek to understand the other person's perspective. So that's one of the things that I have found um, that's been really helpful to me is to lean in when I feel that tendency to withdraw, because I feel it sometimes, you just got to lean in a little closer. Um, so that's been helpful to me, Octavia. That's wonderful. The leaning in, I think, is a really important. It's a, it's a great image and, and metaphor for this. Thank you all. I'm going to ask you um, one of the other questions from um, the committee's list and respond. We don't have to hear from everybody, but think about examples. And I'm going to push you on more recent examples, maybe in the last year, where you have experienced a dialogue, an interaction, um, a discussion, could be family, could be social or organizational or community that you felt like, yeah, this, this really had it. We were really talking about something that was tough. There were different views, but we were taking each other in. And I want you to think about guidelines, maybe just one thing that you felt like helped make that work. And also a time that went off the rails a little bit, like, oops, didn't, didn't really work here. And what do you think got in the way? And we've, got, we've only got about 10 minutes before we're gonna go to hear some questions from the audience. So be as brief as you can and still sharing your wonderful wisdom and experience. Who's got an example or two? I, I can start with one, Octavia. Um, yeah, Becca. Go ahead, Becca. Tanya, you are mid, you go. No, 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 I'm, I'm good. I really am, go ahead. Okay. Um, I am working on this project with the citizens panel in Michigan. And so the beginning of this journey was like grounded in story sharing. And there were people that came in and the framework is around COVID and the COVID response of the state and trying to get back to work. And there are people that are representative of the whole state. So people have very different opinions. Um, and I think where I saw dialogue working was when they kind of stayed grounded in their stories um, where they were able to share, you know, losing loved ones. And then someone could open up and say, you know what, my opinions around mask mandates is because I don't know anyone that's ever gotten COVID. So I just didn't think that it, we needed it. And they could, they could hear each other. And um, that's where dialogue I think works. I think it's grounded in intention, like showing up for a purpose. Um, I think a lot of times it moves at the speed of trust. But the more vulnerable you are, you invite that sort of trust and then you invite that sort of vulnerability. Um, personally, I feel like dialogue is grounded when we don't have to decide something. We don't have to take away and move on to an action item. The process is just the listening, trying to understand and being curious about each other. So in that same project, the next phase was to move toward this sort of deliberative process where they could make policy recommendations for various organizations in their state. And as soon as we moved to like, we have to come to consensus on things, like people started putting up, 
their guardrails. It became more about it's my turn to talk or like, this is the right way. Um, and we lost that personal connection. And that was part of the process and it was kind of designed and intentional to be that way. But I think that when um, you're trying to just have pure dialogue, staying grounded in storytelling and following up with questions um, is great. Thank you. I love that, setting the intention and vulnerability really does help. So who's got another example? I have an example that touches upon a topic I think we're all struggling with right now, which is race relations in this country. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably one of the most powerful evenings I've had at the Levine Museum. We had um, a documentary on historical trauma. And in the room, and there might even be some people on this call that were in the room, um, of 68 people, we had what I would call the old guard Charlotte. We had from the African American community, representatives of people who are 80 plus and, and of the white community. And um, to hear that historical trauma affects both, not just the African American members, but that, you know, hearing a story from an 80 year old saying, I had to sit in the front of the bus while I watched my friends have to walk to the back and how it affected them. It, you know, finding that commonality where at first, you know, I was nervous. How's this going to go? You know, we're talking about a really tough topic here. And because they found that common ground in the experience, it was such a wonderful and uplifting experience. Thank you, Kama. Common ground really helps. We saw that in the, in the video with Charles and the other guy talking about very similar experiences. Um, Tanya, you had, you had something? Yeah, I was going to share that <clears throat> um, our, after the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and other um, African Americans um, at, the, at the hands of police brutality, our, ex our CEO, President and CEO, actually engaged our executive team in dialogue. And we talked about, um, and we, we've gotten to a point where we can have dialogue, but I was really kind of surprised that he was so quick to engage us in this conversation. But we really talked about police brutality, um, what that meant, what it felt like for African Americans. We talked about a perspective of what does law and order mean to people when, when, that, when those words are said. We talked about systemic racism. And so we were able to voice our opinions and thoughts. And I think because We've been working all along that there's, we've been having um, dialogue all along about these issues. Not that we were all totally in agreement with everything that was said, but what it led us to is to have Novant Health um, take a position to support Black Lives Matter. And you all have probably seen it on our website, but it was pretty bold um, as an organization. Um, there were people, and we knew that there would be people in the organization did not, that would not like the boldness of what we did, but we did it, and we did it as an executive team. So I feel like, Octavia, that was a time where we really had some courageous dialogue. Um, we all wanted the same thing in the end, and I think that's how we got to the position statement. Even though you heard different views expressed yes. in that. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's one of the things I'm hearing, Becca has very clear um, guidelines about what real dialogue is. And I know that you do as well, Tanya. And came out, I heard you talk about, get really clear what civil discourse is. Keneal, you wanna say anything about the whole idea of examples of this and how, and how you build to it? Yeah, you know, uh, we've had for many years um, at Atrium Health this uh, model that we called courageous conversations. Sometimes we've held them out in the community, and we've invited community leaders, but we've had, at least in the last four years since I've been there, hundreds of dialogues. Um, and, and I will tell you, um, so we have a new chief diversity officer. His name is Fernando Little, and he's phenomenal and and he is absolutely the right chief diversity officer I think to have led us through the conversations that we needed to have as a health system post George Floyd and um, you know I was always adamantly opposed to virtual dialogues because I had been the sort of kid that grew up in this dialogue that you had to be in the room and you had to be feeling the the 
almost having a whole body experience with the other humans in the room with you. And I just never did feel like we could pull it off, but he really led us through that. And we have had hundreds of dialogues rippling across the system uh, where people have exposed deeply personal stories, in some cases in front of thousands of other teammates about being pulled over, about their fears, about what conversations they have with their children. And it's, it's brought about, I think, a systemic catharsis for us. Not to say that we've solved everything, not to say that we don't, you know, still have things that we need to discuss, but what it's, what it's encouraged me to trust is that when you set up the container the right way, carefully, thoughtfully, with a lot of um, um, common and shared understanding around the civility and, and humanity that has to be present in the dialogue, that you can move souls on a massive level, even in a virtual um, framework, which I was always adamantly opposed to. And, you know, I think that's what's been surprising to me. I think the flip side of that coin is when have I seen dialogues not go well, or when I've seen them go off the rails in those kinds of dialogues, I think where I've seen folks shut down is, you know, when people with privilege, whatever the privilege is, gender privilege, racial privilege, sexual orientation privilege, positional privilege, um, situational privilege, don't acknowledge that. I've seen that um, take the conversation off rails and, I, and I've seen it happen so many times to where I've realized that, that that almost has to be a fundamental element within the discussion is sort of talking about the ways that privilege in society, whatever we're talking about manifests. Canel, James Baldwin said that we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and the right to exist. We just pointed upon that. That's why these times are really difficult because these issues are so fundamental. Yeah, and you know what's funny is I actually wrote that I have in the notes that I prepared for today. I have that James Baldwin quote right there, right in on my screen. It is. Yeah, I mean, I think as and, and Tanya and Gil might be able to chime in as well. But being an African American woman in this space, in this time, with these conversations, you know, it's really hard to take away the emotion. And I heard Dr. Bernice King say this a couple of weeks ago when she spoke to a group virtually here in Charlotte. You know, and she was talking about how have we failed her father's tenets of, of pushing, you know, civil rights forward. And she said, one of the things that we're not doing is no matter who you're talking to, you need to speak to them as if they're a loved one, no matter who they are. Her father would speak to everyone, even the sheriff that's arresting him, as if they're a loved one. Thank you. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move us. I, I, I'm thinking of all these questions, of course, I could ask, but I'm going to try to stay on the, on the uh, list here and also go to a question that's come from one of our attendees. And Gil, I'm going to ask you to start with this one, uh, which is, when is dialogue, true dialogue, useful and meaningful? And when is it an excuse to not truly address an issue. So when is dialogue really meaningful and useful? When is it just an excuse to not fully address an issue? That's a great yeah. question. I think it's meaningful and useful when, when the parties that are having the dialogue have come to an understanding that, and certainly that doesn't mean an agreement, but come to an understanding about what the dialogue is about. Oftentimes we come to the table thinking we're going to be talking about X, but somebody's talking about Y and somebody else is talking about R. But it, and when you can finally say, well, this is what we're trying to talk about. We've got disagreements. We look at it differently. Uh, but this is what we're trying to do. And that dialogue can, at that point in time, be useful. Whatever you come out with, maybe not the best answer, best solution, but you're working towards uh, the same thing. And that's important. When it, when it doesn't, doesn't uh, hold true is when somebody, you, you got two people talking about two different things with the third thing on the table. I, I would like to say, the person that said they were from the western part of North Carolina, really, I'm from Rayford, North Carolina. And Rayford, North Carolina is one of the areas where, where George Floyd had one of his services. 
The sheriff of Rayford, North Carolina, is an African American who's been served there for 20 years. Uh, and uh, he and I've had some dialogue, and we talked about the service that he rendered and his being involved with CNN and MSNBC. Uh, and and um, he told me about dialogues that he's having to, that he needs to have and that he's been engaging in. And, and this is a little different, but it's about meaningful dialogues also. That's why I want to say it. We are going to have a meaningful dialogue because of this discussion. We, we all have bought into this discussion. We may bring different things to it, but we've all bought into it. And, and when black people and white people talk about Black Lives Matter, even if they're kind of opposing, they still kind of bought into it because they decide to have that dialogue. His question to me was that he poses to white people, and I, and I don't necessarily like just talking black and white because being from Rayford, North Carolina, Hope County, we got Native Americans there, Lumbee Indians, and so I'm from a tri-racial county. But his question was, what do white people talk to white people about when there ain't no black people around as it relates to Black Lives Matter? as it relates to systemic racism. And, and one of my good friends that I've worked with for many years, we've done things together. He told me, he says, Gil, I'm ashamed. He said, I don't want to be ashamed of being white. And I told him he didn't have to be ashamed of being white. And I'd stand up for him not being racist with anyone who asked me about it. But I heard someone say earlier, a book that was read and I told him, but not being racist wasn't enough. In this climate that we have now, he needs to be anti-racist. And some people who he has dialogue with that won't talk to me because I am black, that'll talk to him cause he is white. It's where he has to make the difference cause it's a difference that I can't make because we might not get that person to bring it to the table. Thank you, Gil. Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing you say you have to be really clear from the outset what you're trying to do. And actually, there's another question that's very tied with what Gil just said. So I'm going to open it up to the other four of you and you can either take the question I just asked or this one, which is comes from an attendee. How do you engage someone in dialogue and really make them safe to, uh, in saying what it says in the question is that what they say won't be held against them, which is part of what I heard Gil alluding to. How do you create that safety? So either that question or the one earlier about really setting up meaningful dialogue. Right? Anybody want to go for that? I'll jump in because, you know, being the woman from New Jersey in the South, although my mother's from North Carolina and grew up in a little small town here in North Wilkesboro, I am strong, I'm loud, that is my personality, it's how we are in New Jersey. And sometimes, you know, I have been, have these courageous conversations, that's what we're calling these conversations, and because of my, my affect, it comes off stronger, and I have to step back and reassure, like, look, I am so happy that you're on this journey and I want to help in any way that I can. So, you know, um, I always have to do a personal check because what's easy for me to talk about that I've been doing my whole life um, is not is new ground for a lot of people right now. It really is. And that's what's exciting about this time. When you look at the marches that have been going around, you know, in the country, it is multicultural, right? We are coming together for the first time in a way that we have not around these issues. And so so um, you have to respect that not everyone is at the same point. And before, if you're at that point where you're timid and you're not sure, then it's really on you to do some research also before you enter into a tough space. There are so many resources out there, and I know we're going to suggest some resources, but it is not my job as a Black woman to educate you know, the white community, right? And vice versa. Like we've got to each read and learn about each other's experience as well so that we do feel comfortable. Thank you. Anybody else want to add to that or uh, have a different view? Yeah, Octavia, I was thinking, you know, um, being one of your LDI graduates, you do a lot of talking about the components of dialogue, you know, listening, speaking and discovering. And I've really used that in my work. 
and, and, setting, and setting your intention for the dialogue. You know, if your intention is to change the other person's mind, you're not going to get very far. But really kind of setting what your intention is. Is it to really learn? Is it to understand? And I always say to people, um, when you're curious about someone else's religion, curious about their background, you go first. You share about yourself first, which is laying the groundwork for a safe space. If you're going to be vulnerable, then maybe I would be vulnerable. So I really would encourage that. And some of the things that I remember, Octavia, from our um, LDI that I use is that's been really helpful to me is that um, acknowledging and remember there are multiple realities. You've, you all have seen that six and a nine. And if you stand on one side of the six or the nine, it looks like a six and the other side looks like a nine. And then um, sharing airtime. Sometimes we can become so passionate. You know, I could be, I obviously speak for myself because I believe we should use I statements. I could become so passionate that I may lose someone in the group. So making sure that I'm, I'm clear that I'm really there also to listen and understand the other person. Um, it's hard to um, suspend judgment but that is really important. And for me, I have to kind of get my mindset to say, okay, I'm really here to learn what Camille is saying and her perspectives. And I have to really focus myself to do that so I can suspend judgment. But there are lots of different, I mean, um, areas under those three components that Octavia, you had, that you taught us in uh, LDI. But I, in stating your intention, um, I have found really works. Um, to have the dialogue. Thank you, Tanya. I, I'm gonna, with, with that, I'm gonna close this out um, with, a, I'm gonna encourage you all to be vulnerable here, the panelists. I'm, the question I'm gonna ask that maybe you can respond in one sentence is, because Tanya, you kind of started this, what's hardest for you personally? What are you working on? What is your stretching? What do you realize you have to pay attention to you and you personally in mm -hmm. order to be uh, a true participant in dialogue across differences? Um, for me, it's that supporting and challenging Octavia, that I wanna be supportive of where people are, um, but I also have to challenge what's being said. So I wanna, I wanna maintain relationships because when you challenge, you, do, you can yep. sever ties or relationships. So you, have, you, know, you can lose something, you can lose something. You always talk about, being courageous, you have to you have to have a fear of something when you're going to be courageous. So there are times when you want to challenge and you think about the fear of losing a relationship, whether it's with a friend or a coworker or a family. So I think that's what I do all the time. I'm thinking in my head, okay, when I challenge, how do I also support them where they are, but still challenge and maintain the relationship that I want with this Thank person? You. So, Keneal, I'm going to go to you. Something that you are willing to share that you're working on or is hard for you or is tough. Thank you, Tanya. I'm Sorry. still, Octavia, trying to figure out why I'm on this panel because I'm not sure I have a role model. And plus, Tanya is one of my good friends. And so she has a poise about these things that I have always um, tried to emulate but never quite um, nailed on the head. So I love listening to her talk about it. I think, you know, for me, I feel like I've been working my whole life, my whole adult life at least, on uh, social justice. That's, that's my chosen career, and I've chosen to devote a lot of my education to it. And um, what that means is I've been a formal student of issues of inequality, and, it's, and so I know a lot of like statistics, and I can rattle them off, but what I realize is that's just incredibly annoying to other people in, in dialogue about this stuff. And, and I, I've come to believe that it doesn't actually move the dialogue further. And I was listening to Becca talk about, you know, like when did the dialogue really um, thrive? And I think it's when you get in, into your heart space and your kind of personal storytelling space and talk about your own personal experiences um, that you can be more vulnerable and authentic. When I get very, um, scholarly or analytical or start spatting out research, um, you know, I'm really into research. So I like it a lot, but I've also yeah. found it doesn't move the dialogue for it. So that's my challenge. I think it's Thank just you. So be more authentic with your, with your real self. That's what I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Becca. 
Um, I think that what I struggle with is kind of the relationships Tanya was mentioning. It's easy for me to have space to create dialogue in my community and open it up. But when it comes to like that closer um, circle of people and circle of influence, uh, I may be a little hesitant. And I think also kind of getting comfortable with silence, just letting things have space. Sometimes I jump in because I try and fill and to just sit, especially when people are sharing stories, it's okay to just, to just sit and let it settle. And I think um, additionally, I'm comfortable with a structured dialogue, which takes a lot of that nervousness out when you have a conversation guide and agreements. And so taking those skills and transitioning them into my personal life, uh, where I practice them all the time, is another place where I challenge, I feel challenged. Thank you, Becca. Gil, something you feel like personally you're working on to be better at this? or recognize that you're not as good as you want to be? Well, recognize I'm not as good as I want to be because uh, the end result is to say some things or point out some things anecdotally or whatever that gets that will get people to work together. And I find myself being caught up in talking about sports kind of metaphors because I do have a real belief that if we thought as a team and the team may have different positions and different numbers on your uniform, but everybody's trying to win the game. And, you know, you try not to necessarily be the person that's the star because it's better to win than to lose. If you're a star and lose, you still didn't win the game. But what I work on more than anything else is that I think the whole concept of, of, of racism and sexism and, and all the negative things that divide us, I think those things are stupid. And what I have trouble is in having a dialogue and keeping the dialogue that I think those things are stupid without it seeming like I think the people who believe those things are stupid. And if you give that impression, and I appreciate uh, uh, talking about being, being a black female and, 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 and you know, having that sister swag with you, I'm 6'8", and I'm bigger than most people that I talk to. So now I've got to deal with the fact that I'm so much bigger and that's even more intimidating and black. And now I also have to deal with my other, uh, other uh, situations I don't see. So that might make my movements more intimidating. So I'm trying to figure out a way to show the, 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 the fact that we aren't together as being non-productive and stupid <laughs> without making the stupid part overshadow the positive dialogue part. Thank you, Gil. Well said. Kama, can you do it in a sentence? We're past time here. Something that you're working on. Trust, plain and simple. I, I consider myself an authentic person and um, you've got to trust that and I've got to trust it won't be used against me. <laughs> Thank you so much. You all have just been wonderful. I, I really appreciate what you brought tonight. Uh, we are there. We ask them to bring some resources, and I think we can probably make those available to the attendees or put in chat because there's some really good resources here. But thank you so much. I've loved being with you all, and I think you've brought great wisdom and insight to this topic. So back to Patricia. Thank you, Octavia. And I hate to stop this conversation. I really, I know many of us on the call feel like we could continue this for a long time. Um, I hope all of the attendees will join me in thanking our panelists for sharing their time and energy with us, both from your personal and professional experiences and for being vulnerable with us this evening. I hope that everyone feels like they have an action item or something they can do or take away from this evening, whether from the movie or from this wonderful group of panelists. Thank you to our Social Hour for Social Issues, Signature Event Subcommittee, the Member Education Committee, moderator Octavia Sewell, and our community partner, Morin Van Allen, especially Brianna for joining us for making this evening possible. And thank you to you, our members and our guests for joining us. We hope to see each of you again in another Women's Impact Fund event. Please check our website for details on what's coming up. Until then, stay healthy and well. Good night. <laughs>